Hi everyone and welcome to Accents. My guest today is Melva Supridi, a favorite poet of mine. Hi Melva, welcome to the show. Hi Katarina, it's good to be here. Well, for those who um, are listening, I've been a fan of yours since the very first time I heard you read a poem and Melva and I uh, go way back. We um, met each other at Spalding in 2009, 2010, something like that, right? And um, and it is uh, an honor for me to ask Melva questions about her first book, The Tillable Land. Uh, first, I'm going to read to you her bio. Melva Supridi grew up working on her family's dairy and tobacco farm in the knobs of Kentucky from the time she could stand on the brakes of a tractor using her two feet to stop it. Pretty worked the farm. By the third grade, she managed with her younger siblings rotating between milking the cows, feeding the calves, and feeding cattle. And by eighth grade, she managed the dairy, milking cows twice daily, keeping breeding records and passing infection every month. By the time Pretty left home at 19 years old, what started out as a 70-acre family effort had grown to be 200 acres. With degrees from Berea College and University of Kentucky, Melva taught English language art and creative writing for 20 years. After retiring, she earned her MFA from Spalding University. And as I said before, The Tillable Land is her first book. I want to ask you first about the book, if you could tell us the story about the story. Tell us how you wrote, <laughs> how you, uh, wrote this book. How did it come about? Um, my mother, on my father's 80th birthday, gave me and my five siblings um, a birthday bag <laughs> with photographs. She's she separated and and put into the bags photos, family photos from our infancy on up. And um, I went on a reading, a writing retreat um, and took the pack of, of photos and I looked through them and realized that that I only had one photo of me actually working in that pack. And um, so it got me thinking about all that work we did and no documentation of it. So um, I started writing about working and the different types of jobs I had, the different experiences I had with, with working. And, um, and that got me started on writing this book. And then um, I attended a, a two-day workshop with Rebecca Gail Howe, and I said to her, Rebecca, I think you could be make, help me be braver. And she said, Melba, I think you could help me be braver. So in, in um, December of that year, we, we decided to start working together in January, and um, so she had me doing some exercises that helped me break some bad habits that I had with writing. And then, and reading, reading a phenomenal amount of books. And then, um, then by November and December of that year, I, she had me to start doing some writing of my own and she she asked me to do certain things and we started out with redrafting some poems that I had written before with these new skills and um and then from January to May April to April, from January to April 
she was out of state working and she gave me enough work to do those three or four months, four months, I guess, uh, and said, call me anytime, email me anytime. But I didn't. I started writing and I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And um, when she looked at my work, uh, she said, Nova, you've got a book here. And so then we started putting that book together and we had it ready to submit in May. Yeah. And the book is now a fact. Yes. <laughs> please, yeah. des please describe it uh, and please tell us about uh, the cover image. The cover is by uh, Julian Dupree, I think his name is. Um, yeah, Julian Dupree. And it's called In the Pasture, The Milkmaid. And it was painted, it's oil on canvas, 1883. It is in the permanent collection at the University of Kentucky Art Museum. Yeah. So we, we, we asked for permission to use it. And then um, Virginia got a a certain size pixel photograph of it to be able to use it on the cover. Yeah, I was really pleased. Thank you so much for telling us the story behind the book. Now I would love for us to hear a few poems and then we'll continue. Okay. Okay. Um, this is one I often read first when I do a reading uh, because it gives the background to my parents and the first, but first 70 acres. Um, and because we said grace at every meal, then this leads up to that. It's called Lord bless this food and the hands that prepared it. It's true. The house was close to 200 years old. The main rooms, two upstairs, two downstairs, hewn log, two porches and a bedroom added on. Story is, after they married, when they first found the farm, the rooms were full of seeds, fescue and rye, clear to the ceilings, seeds they wouldn't have to buy. The surrounding fields lay wasted, unfarmed, eroded. Story is, unable to get a loan or a cosigner anywhere, even his father wouldn't go a note. They'd mortgaged against yearly crops, tobacco check as payment. Understand, they had other choices. He decided against college, chosen farming instead. She'd put him off marriage two years and graduated high school a year ahead of herself. What they did then was work night and day, two jobs each, both farming, he a tobacco factory in Louisville, she gardening, raising the children that came. They had other choices. The fields, they couldn't level themselves. They saved up and bulldozed later. Eventually, they spread all those seeds, emptying one room at a time, seeds that firmed the soil. One room at a time, they moved into that house, gathering cast off furniture. By the time they emptied the second room, they found the table somewhere, a used table with leaves to expand. The table's laminated top would serve as biscuit board, candy marbled slab, hot canning jar lineup, and chopping block. The table's rim, silver lipped, would be scrubbed twice a year with steel wool and a knife tip. Three times a day, plates arrived. Meals with the main dish already divided, a can of mackerel or a pound of burger stretched to serve eight or more. No one ate until the food was blessed. No one ate until those who prepared the food were blessed. No one ate until the rain was blessed. No point to protest when he circled the table, taking bites of food off our plates. He moved to the head where he sat, bowed his head, and prayed. 
Um, this one is called Before the First Milking. It's page four. In the furthest field cedars stand, we found the calf hidden. Brother and me, six and seven, followed him, plodding frozen ruts from tractor tires, hearing him bawl. Towels are just like women. They lose their minds when they give birth. The calf stood as we closed in. It had been licked clean. Then Johnny, after birth and shit hanging from her swollen vulva, bellowing, running towards us, toward her calf, he took up a stick to keep her back. Brother and me prodded, half carried the calf while Johnny pounded circles, her tits squirting milk, warm milk at us and the numb ground. Um, this one is called among the things we counted on daily, school. Um, and I can, okay, I'll just read it. <laughs> Party line out, electricity out. We lived the end of each line. Water frozen, cold breakfast, milk, crackers. The blizzard cold, morning windows white. The car wouldn't start. The tractor wouldn't start. No radio. Bus drivers usually added tire chains we, for snow and ice, we knew. But they, but were they running today? One thing our parents wanted of us, never miss a day. Even sick, we went. It was more restful school than staying home. Three of us, we doubled socks, we doubled pants, we pulled on coats, we pulled on hats, we slung school satchels over our shoulders and necks. She wrapped and diaper pinned his head in towels, his mouth and neck covered, only his eyes in view. Then they wrapped us, our arms looped together in blankets, turned around, turned around, darkness. We heard the door open. Holding the blanket tops over our heads, he shuffled us into the snow. All around became muffled howls, darkness. Then the snow scuffled lane, half a mile. Arms linked, we stumbled, we tipped, we swayed. Into him, into each other, over and over. My feet numbed, the rest of my body sweated. He, if he spoke, nothing heard but the wind's howl. So slow, we could not pierce, piece out the two hills we knew by heart. Darkness, all darkness. I asked mom, I can't remember if we had school, if the buses ran or not. I can't remember him walking us back home. But I asked mom about it. She goes, Lord Melba, I don't remember those things. <laughs> she had no idea either. This is our sinkhole. Why worry? Mothers come in, carried to our weedy gullies. Why worry? The house in view through the lacy trees. Why worry? We were there together. We plunged in every chance we could carve. The four or five of us plunging into the dense green, we lunged onto the ropey vines draped around the shaded sinkhole. Our parents knew, never seemed worried, except we were never allowed during rain. The pit's depth, we couldn't guess. Rocks dropped in, never sounded. Rocks bounced side to side, thudded, swallowed. It amazed us. Why worry? It never washed out, just widened. The green undergrowth flattened every rain, but stood still. Again, tree root anchored. The tiger lilies, a total mystery. All the flowers, as if a house once stood there.
Uh, well, Melba. Um, this book comes with <laughs> uh, this book comes with its own trigger warning, right? At the beginning. Right. Right. Yeah. So um I yeah. want to ask about for you to talk to us about the realities of being a woman farmer. Um, I lived at home for until I was 19. And then after I moved out, I still came back and helped set tobacco. And then once I was divorced um, and started to college, which was about 10 years after um, I graduated from high school, I continued to go back home. I called it home. <laughs> I continued to go back home and help with setting tobacco, um, chopping out weeds. I took my kids. We all worked. Um, topping tobacco on weekends after school started. Um, working on weekends, stripping tobacco. Um, the only thing I didn't go back and do was milk cows. Um, I had lost the patience for dealing with cows in the milk barn. So I continued to do that until I was 34. The reality was that, um, well, when I was in third grade, dad came and got us and took us to the bank in Sonora and opened a checking account for each of the three of us oldest ones. And um, so we were all in school. And the checking account was so that he could pay us and get tax deductions for hiring us as helping working on the farm. And then in return for what we got, we paid for our own boots for milking. We paid for our own school clothes. We paid our own school lunches. We bought our own shoes. Um, I don't think we had to buy coats at first, but we paid for everything we needed. And um, out of your own wages. Out of our own wages, yes. Um, so there wasn't much left over for. I think we started asking mom, like I would ask mom to get me a package of um, Big Newtons. I like those. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we we would ask mom to pick up something at the grocery and we had to pay for that. Um, but it was ours. It wasn't everybody's. And um, And then as we got older and started working in the fields more, um dad would pay us for working and but he always paid the boys more than he did the girls did so, he give rationale for that or it was just the way it was i asked i asked he said <laughs> well there's they're stronger than you are and um and it you know at first at first i only had the one brother my my younger brother was not is nine years younger than me so um so he wasn't working much when I was living at home but yeah dad said they they were stronger they had more muscles than we did they could lift heavier things we didn't see that to be very true yeah yeah in fact um, there were often times when the girls were asked to go back and redo some jobs that the boys had done and had done incorrectly, which I never understood because if they hadn't done it correctly, why shouldn't they be the ones to redo it? Um, which was difficult to do because the job hadn't been done right, which meant like if I was bush hogging, um, there were stobs instead the trees hadn't like um cedar trees growing in the field hadn't been cut off correctly and so 
there were actually stops, we called them stops, the main trunk cut off with a sharp point on it. And so we had to be careful to go certain ways with the tractor and the bush hog. Um, that never seemed fair. And when the boys turned 16, they each got a truck. The girls could only use uh, the family car if we, if, if it was something that we could justify that we needed the car for. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, we were running errands with it to pick up parts for car, for the tractors and parts for the machinery um, and running errands for dad. Um, men, men were privileged and in charge. Yes. Very yes. much so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, um, in your bio, the second sentence is that you started to uh, run, I guess, to operate a tractor as soon as as soon as the, the feet could reach, right? So right. Well, did yeah. you did you learn to um, did you learn to ride bike first or to ride a tractor first? I didn't have a bike until I was eleven years old, um, and it was a used bike, and Dad put me on it and pushed me down a hill, and that's. He did that until I could pedal it correctly. Um, now the tractor, um, it was a slow, gradual process, but dad would put me on it to drive the tractor through the field while uh, men were loading the tobacco because I was too young to load tobacco. Um, he would have me to drive the tractor through a hay field so that um, he and who, whoever he had hired to help could load the hay on the wagon. Um, that kind of thing. Yeah. It, and it was really hard at first because um, he'd yell stop and I had to put both feet on the brake mm -hmm. and push against it. Yeah. And then um, when I was ready to go, I had to step off of it and just do what he said. Earlier, you said something like, so when I left at 19 and then when I got divorced, I came back home. I called it back home. I wonder why. I don't know. Um, I think I think all of us called it home. And, and some of us still call it going home, even though we all have our own homes. Maybe it was just because it was our first home, you know, and very young, we try as children, it does, you know, it doesn't matter how your parents treat you as children, you learn to do what they ask you to do or what they expect of you. And you put up with what they're doing because you, we didn't know any better. And, <clears throat> and they were our parents. Yeah. I you know. Um, we had to trust them. Even in, even with the evidence that we couldn't trust them, we continued to trust them. Yeah. What about your children? What do your children say about um, your upbringing and um, what you lived through being a young woman on a farm? Well, they both farmed there too. Okay. So they knew what the work was like they knew it was hard work um but that was the way i paid for groceries while i was going to college that was the way i put tires on my car that was the way you know when i had extra expenses car repairs um that was the way i could pay for it and still continue to go to college um they know it was work they know it was hard work um my son and I have talked about the fact that 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 we have both had to deal with people who have mistreated us. And it's crummy, but that's the way it is. And and it's a shame. Um 
my daughter um, knows more probably about the things that happened to me. And when she read my book and in a couple of different stages, she was a good reader and she could give me some good feedback, even though she doesn't write poetry. And she said, mom, it's just so sad. It's so sad. It just, the whole book, just, I read straight through the manuscript and it is just so sad. And to me, it's not so sad to me. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of good things that happened. There were advantages to growing up on the farm and to learning how and advantages to learning how to work young. Um, How's that served you throughout life? That learning to work from very young age, maybe having a bank account at a very young yeah. age. I knew how to manage a bank account. I knew how to, I knew how to do those things. I knew how to balance a checkbook uh, from an early age. I was using my math skills, <laughs> you know, as I learned them. Um, I learned to do a job and do it well, and to do it well the first time, which meant I became a perfectionist which served me well when I was doing student teaching, when I was in college. It served me well when I was doing student teaching and when I started teaching. Um, I was proud of the fact that I could do a good job. I could take care of my students at the same time that I could be prepared for, well, I would have like three lesson plans for everything depending on what the kids interests went into went to so that I could I could switch gears right in the middle of a lesson and go the way that their interests were but still cover what I need to cover yeah so it really it really had it really did help me and then the professional uh, perfectionism it's a double-edged sword so what about it's, the other <laughs> I had to learn to undo that. Um, and that was my my doctors. Melva, you've got to slow down. Melva, you've got to quit doing some of these things. You've got to let some things go. Yeah. What about perfectionism when editing and publishing a book? I normally uh, think that up to <laughs> you, know. Point, you know, you will never release it. You will never finish it if you, you have to at some point say this is a time stamp of my best efforts. Right. Right. Um, I had, I thought that the book was finished when Rebecca and I had it finished. And when uh, Virginia Underwood with Shadlin House, Modern Press, and I, and we did all the editing, we did everything by phone and uh, email because this would happen during COVID. We were ready in 2019. Um, no, it was 2020. We, she, she wanted the book in 2019, but as soon as they shut everything down with COVID, I said, and it went on longer than we expected. Um, she had a death in her family. My father died. Um, he, he didn't die from COVID. He had a stroke. Um, but we did everything online or through the phone and I was amazed at how many mistakes there were and inconsistencies to deal with in editing and Virginia and I both worked at that um and it I, I don't remember how many times we went through that book um the manuscript but it was it was pretty overwhelming and at a certain point we said that's it done. yeah it yeah. was a joint effort <laughs> you know as a as a publisher i tell people if you find 10 errors do not tell me i do not want to <laughs> know <laughs> um yeah so uh, let me ask if you know you said that your father passed during covid 
uh, while you were working on the book, while you're finishing it, did it make it more difficult or easier to release the book? It didn't change anything. Okay. Um, I didn't tell anybody in my family about what was in the book. Um, they were all excited that I was getting a book published. Mom was excited about it. I don't know. Um, I don't think I told any of the family other than one sister who's very supportive um, that I was even going to have a book published. And I didn't um, tell mom until it was sent um, for public. I mean, it was sent to, to be it. published. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then I, I offered to my mom, I said, mom, do you want to read the book before it comes out? Do you want to read it? Do you want me to read it with you? Or do you want to experience it the same way everybody else does? And she said, I want to experience it the same way everybody else does. So it's very yeah. honorable. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad I thought to do that, <laughs> to ask her and to give her those options. And, um, and so that's what happened. And, um, I know I have been told that um, she said some of it made her heart hurt. Um, but I know that some of the poems she really liked. And the she came to my she came to my opening reading. It's wonderful. Yeah. And in effect, this is your set of photographs. Yes. Yep. Yes. So, um, I'm very much I'm very much um want want the poems to be very visual mm -hmm. and emotional. Um but I try in the book to not tell the reader what to think. I leave it I wanted to leave it up to the readers to know what to think for themselves what they wanted to. Um but yeah, they are photographs of working yeah they are the photographs that you want to leave behind on um, mm -hmm. this is uh i have a lot more questions but i want to hear several more poems now if you would okay, okay. um the i'm going to read the very first um the opening poem what chose to be remembered Scored by water frozen in our ponytails from morning wake-up call. Scored by the broad-hipped Holstein walking within hand's reach, her soiled rump following the soiled rump before her. Scored by the wolf moon's hunger and charm, her predatory eye fixed on us. Scored by the unsteady ground jarring, slowing our steps, bone cold and familiar. Each morning we coaxed the herd. But two, each cow's billowing breath, the silver shimmered pond's edge, the snowflakes images repeated just above the freezing water. And we were scored too by life's tingling numbness. And I want to read um, the first Villanelle. There are, I think, 10 Villanelles in the book, and maybe 12 odes. Um, and those were the only two forms that I used in that made it into the book. Um, the Villanelle is, it's a repeating form, um, but it's a good way to write about things that are difficult to write about. So this is Mending Fences and Family Work. The farm raged with rundown fences between fields and farms, boundaries that seemed confined, safe, stable, fixed. In truth, 
the cattle made no pretense. They walked through rotted posts and pounded brittle wire. The farm raged with rundown fences. In every fence row stood hedge apple trees, cedar, wild cherry, thistles, cockle burrs, rusted machinery that seemed confined, safe, stable, fixed. Blackberry thorns, honeysuckle vines, long lengths without barbed wire were no tension and down trees. The farm raged with rundown fences begging remove, repair, replace, expenses. But we merely restrung, wrapped wire, hammered staples, fences seemed confined, safe, fixed. Indeed, the family had no such boundaries. All it took, head down, butting up with intention. The farm raged with rundown fences and nothing confined safe, fixed. Um, the next poem I'm going to read is called Kitchen Empty. All hands at work in the fields, our house cool, maple shaded. I stopped for a glass of water or maybe it was supper chores. And then I heard their peeps, like tin bells jangling between my soft, soft, small steps. Behind the table, the cabinet, the folded towels, the garden box. The pink hairless thimbles, hunger nested in shredded paper and seeds warmth. I knew what they'd say. I closed the box tucked it under my arm, took father's boot in my hand. What I want you to know is I had to, that the screen door clapped as I walked to the burning bin, that I did not look again. This poem is, well, I'll read this one first. This is, each a new self held up by the hands of all the ones before. Um, my father's mother, when I was young, was a very magical person to me. She had talents that I didn't know anybody else who had. Um, and she is, uh, we, her, I call her Mammy in the book. Um, and that is not a disparaging name for her. That's what my grandfather called her. And that's what he referred to my mother as ma my mammy. And then mammy was his wife, my grandmother. Each a new self held up by the hands of all the ones before. I was certain it happened like this without a pattern without measurements, ants married or in school, using her thick fingers, her broad hands, Mammy patted the material straight, patted it across her bed. A cut apart piece or a sales piece purchased, the scissors in her hand, she cut out a dress, cut with a knowing eye, straight lines, curved lines, then treadle machined and hand stitched. I saw her. An ant wore the dress. Outgrown, the next ant wore it. Which one? And the next, which one are you? No one could tell them apart. Once all ants had left home, Mammy passed dresses to Mother, who cut them apart gently, seam by seam. She fit by holding material against my body. With sewing machine, she made a new dress and it was passed down to each of my sisters. Sometimes mother made three or four dresses of a full, a single full skirt. Then we did look alike. Which one, which one are you? Okay, this is another villanelle. It's called Heartwood. 
Mother and I were the last soap pie. We both had hazel eyes. His eyes brown, my father could see I was sure in the dark. I thought he could see through me. I thought he was wise. Therefore, I couldn't lie. Only in solitude, I revealed myself to myself. With six thoughts at once, I labored to be confused. Not stupid, just smart. Inside my head, I understood. Mother and I, the oldest girls with hazel eyes. Our only visible God, he kept our world small. Rain clouds and blue skies, he couldn't control. But one dark look across the room, he jerked me up short. I thought he could see through me. I actually thought he was wise. He kept our world small, mothers and mine. But another God spoke with me at three, and words formed song through my veins. This God and my heart, not my heart, but my bones core. This God mothered me. We shared eyes. My God saw through the tangled thoughts, then hid me deep inside my own bones heart, where no one could touch me. Listening in dirt, this God sat inside my thoughts, sang with me, no doubt wise. Growth rings encircle one life, outward looks merely disguise, the other life left out in the world. My secret power from hurt, mother and I, still the last to get by, we both had hazel eyes. Father's dark eyes couldn't see through me, but he thought he could. One more? Or no, that's four, isn't it? Oh, well, no, we'll hear more in, in a little bit. It's just, I could just weep after this set, and especially the last one, because I remember hearing it and spoiling, and the thing that just really seared into my memory was labored to be confused. And at first, it was jarring for me. It's like, whoa, what does that mean? How does one that do that? And then throughout the years, I cannot tell you, you don't know that, how many times I have thought about that poem and about that expression. And I have found that in my own history. And I have known, oh, that's how. Oh, here it is. That is how one can labor to be confused. And it is such a gift to know, to be clear with yourself. And it is so difficult, especially if that has been muddled with <laughs> in your formative years. And uh, well, that's not a question. It's just a thank you for yeah. what you have done for me with your poetry. And that was some years back. And here's the question. How old is the oldest poem in this book? The oldest poem in this book was one that I wrote about my children uh, before I even started the program. Um, that's the oldest one. And there are some poems um, that I redrafted from poems that I had written before the, the MFA program. Uh, because I wrote with my with my creative writing kids when they were writing. Um, and if I gave them a new assignment, I said, Miss Pretty, this is a new assignment? Yeah, you need to do this with us. <laughs> and so I would. <laughs> um, but I can tell you that Heartwood, the, that one I just read, it the villanelles mimic the way PTSD works. Right. And um this particular poem, when I started writing it as a villanelle, it pulled in like four or five other poems that I had previously written. Uh, but this was much stronger than those other poems were to begin with. I've written poems just about the God part. I've written poems just about me and mother 
and and let's see my youngest brother has hazel eyes but for the longest time it was just me and mom and so dad made fun of us because our eyes were different from his um and then the thing about having six different thoughts at a time i actually counted at time uh, there were different times when i counted how many things i was thinking about at the same time and i don't know if that happened to me because of ptsd but i do remember thinking I don't want him to know what I'm thinking. And so well the thing the thing that you're you're saying that having two multiple thoughts at the same time, which some people claim it's impossible. You can think about this or you can think about this, but I have caught myself thinking se several things and sometimes contradicting ones at the same time. And I'm like, whoa, that to me is a fragmentation of some sort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. yes, PTSD. I'll I'll say that. And the question I have about that is, I wrote my own, you know, uh, upbringing and trauma upbringing book, and I have to tell you that it took me about a year to climb out of it afterwards, because just being inside it, reading from beginning to end, that was difficult. That mm -hmm. was difficult. Did you need any time to emerge out of the content when you were done? No, no, no. no. Um, journaling is um, decompression for me. Yeah, writing poems is did not induce any problems with me. Um, I had done a lot of therapy. I've been in therapy most of my life. Um, and that started when um, when I went through my, before I went through my first divorce. Um, I did some therapy with my, my now ex-husband. But, um, but I've had to go back in and work with it at different times. I was much older before I realized that I had PTSD. And it was diagnosed uh, by a sleep doctor, in fact. Um, I think I forgot what your question was. Well, my question was, did you need time to reemerge from oh. the book? And no, no it sounded no. sounded no that it was uh, at the point where you had you were already at a at a different place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So it it was really a joy. To work on the poems and even the sad poems I, it was just a joy because it was me perfecting my art at that point yeah so no i've not had any problem with that and what has the reception of the book been so far i've had good reception good reception um only one of my sisters has spoken to me about the book and um and her reception was was so interesting because when she told me what I didn't read her favorite poem she said at the um I'm gonna have to find it so I can read it to you but um her favorite poem, she said, you didn't read my favorite poem. And it was, it was something I couldn't read because mom was there. Okay. Um, or I didn't think I would feel comfortable reading. I did read some poems I knew mom would be comfortable with. Um, but I know another sister has the book and she's not made any comments to me about it. I know that one of my aunts bought copies of the book but she has not spoken to me about her reception but so other than those people anybody else I've talked to has has said really good things about it and that's been very, very tell us how it how it's possible how is it possible to let earth the earth heal us from family trauma. 
for me, it was because um, I love to go walking in the woods, like on Sunday afternoons between milkings and church. Um, because unless the cow was in the ditch, <laughs> we didn't have to work on Sundays other than milking the cows. But when I was working in the field, often I was alone. And I'm out there where the, the all the fence rows were had trees in them. So there were always trees. Um, and I'm working with the soil or I'm, I'm um, cutting, raking, baling hay. All those jobs. I was by myself and just left to do the work. And, um, and for me, to be in a family of eight where people didn't talk, they yelled, and you couldn't be heard unless you yelled. Mm -hmm. And then you were, we were yelled at a lot. Um, it was, it was amazing to be by myself in solitude in nature. Um, but I think, I think nature is very healing when we treat the earth with the care that we should give ourselves and um and i think the earth gives i mean it's like the yoga you have your feet planted on the earth is what my instructor says it grounds you and that is the way you're grounded um and uh, through COVID and even this summer, um, we did yoga outside in the park. Um, Saturday mornings, Monday and Wednesday afternoons. Um, and that's very grounding. And I have found that to be true. And a lot of people enjoy walking in nature, just being outdoors. I think that's very healing. Me, myself, I always love the trees and the rocks the best. <laughs> I like those, but I also like running water or sitting by the by the sea. That's where yeah. I grew up. Now let's get back to the milking of cows because you're accomplished uh, at that uh, and you're practically royalty. <laughs> Um, so we started helping with the milking when, when we were very young, very young, um, when we were young enough that all we did was bring the cows into the milking stall for dad. Um, by the time I was in high school, I was milking 30 cows every morning and every evening. And sometimes one of my younger siblings was placed with me to learn how to do that um, as they were placed with my oldest brother and sister with the, their chores. Um, we, we had electric milkers and we first started out with two stalls, I mean, two cows in each stall, and we were in the middle. Um, but we were lowered so that putting our hands right out, we were, we, were, we were right at the level where putting our hands out, we were right there to put the milkers on the cow. And then uh, we went from cans, milking into cans, which was grade C into milking with milkers grade B, uh, electric pipeline. And then we went to grade A. Um, we got more money for it, but there were more restrictions. We had to get rid of all the pigs on the farm. And um, because we couldn't have pigs close to the milk parlor okay. at all. And um, and then passing inspection by the time I was um, eighth grade, I think, um, I had to pass inspection. So we never knew when the inspector would come out, but it was my job to keep that 
milk barn clean. And you were um, the Harding County Dairy Princess. That's why I said that you were. Oh. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I can't remember exactly how that happened, except that um, there was this Dairy Princess contest, and somebody suggested that I should apply, and it was an application. And so three of us uh, came in first, second, and third. So you competed. Then, uh huh. And, so did you uh, actually milk to compete? No, no, no. We oh. just, I think we all had some connection to farming or to a dairy farm. Um, probably I was the one who was managing the barn, whereas the other two women probably weren't. But I think that's probably what got me the first first choice. So being a princess, uh, did you receive little crown or no, no crown. Nothing, nothing? No crown. No crown. Um, it was... There was a small uh, dairy, dairy milk month, which I think was always in June. Um, there was a small presentation. Um, don't remember a crown. And then there was a radio interview. And that was it. No other, no other, you know, no bathing suit, no milk cow court, uh, coveralls to, <laughs> or anything. <laughs> no, no other chores. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. And then um, I happen to know that one of your uh, hobbies is people watching. What what draws your interest? What makes you look twice at somebody? I'm just really interested in watching people. And I'm afraid probably sometimes people think I'm staring, but I'm, I just... I like hearing their voices. Mm -hmm. um, I like noticing cheekbones, the way they wear their hair. And it's not like I'm not grading it, you know. Um, I'm not picking out who looks the best or anything like that. I just really like watching people and how so very different we can all be in spite of the fact that most of our cells are similar, you know. Um, I just find it really interesting how many different sizes and colors and shapes we come in and different mannerisms. Yeah, I just find all that interesting. I enjoy watching how people relate to each other and how they talk to each other. And I've written many a poem based on conversation snippets that I've, that I've heard because that is of great interest to me. Mm -hmm. um, here is a question I ask everybody who uh, teaches creative writing, and that is, what is the most important thing you teach your students? If there is one thing that you want them to remember from your workshop, what is it? I want them to be open-minded, and I want them to be kind with each other, especially when there's a class. Um, I established the fact that creative writing was a, is a, in high school is a chosen class. It's not a re required class. And what happens is all the kids who feel like they're oddballs everywhere else elect to take a creative writing class. And the first thing they learn is there's a bunch of oddballs in this class. <laughs> We, and it's a mix of ninth through 12th graders. And that's one of the first classes that they can take. One of the few classes that they can take where you have ninth through 12th graders in the same class. And so I want them to be open-minded. I want them to learn to be tolerant with each other and to be kind with each other because that's necessary to establishing the atmosphere that will allow them all to be creative. Yeah. And we have time for one or two more points. 
Okay. And um, I would love to hear more poems from the book. Okay. I want to read this one that my sister liked. It's on page 54. Let me go far enough. Okay. Skipping pages, you know. 54. You did not teach us everything we know. And I can tell you this is a riff on Georgella Lyons' prayer poem. Our Father who art in the field or on the road, or who knows where. Hallowed may we be wherever you plant us. Delivered from your hands, your children, your flesh, work daily this earth, work daily this soil, as if it were heaven. And sometimes it was heaven. Give us this day, breakfast, dinner, and supper. Give us cold milk, cold water, warm food. Cover our hands, heads from the rain, cover our feet from the snow, cover our bodies from blows. Father, we must thrive in order to work. Give us one third of 1% of each bi-monthly milk check. Wages to pay for shoes, boots, clothes, wages to pay for school lunches, pencils, paper, books. Forgive us our accidents spilling milk, spilling soup, spilling anything at the table. Forgive us our mistakes, letting the cows into the wrong field, milking the wrong cow, forgetting anything. Forgive us our mishunches, usually based on your often bad directions, handing you the wrong tool, opening the wrong gate, dodging out of your arm's reach, until we learn to be perfect like you perfect like you. Help us learn to hold our tongues, hold still during your lectures, hold each other back from the stones and dirt clods you throw in your father-given right, in your father-given anger, and lead us not into back-talking. If we believe that we're made in your image, that we will only ever have your kind of love that people who love us will also hate us, abuse us, belittle us. Will we ever be able to love? Will we ever be able to thrive? Will we ever be able to walk into adulthood unashamed? Deliver us from your world, for yours is your kingdom, your power, your forever farmland with daughters paid lower wages than sons, daughters who carry buckets half full and buckets over full, daughters work outdoors and in-house too, although to be fair, the sons, the sons didn't ask to be born, your sons. Um, I, I want to read, there are several I would love to read, but this this will be the last one. Um, this is one from my adulthood. And um, in 2012, I received a one-week residency at Hopscotch House. So this is called We Do the Hard Work, Then We Teach Our Children or Hopscotch House Residency, Kentucky Foundation for Women. It's on page 71. Last night, I walked through the pasture toward the road. Something connected me to the dead deer flung into the creek, her legs running into the dark woods water in her last breath, death. All around, pulsing raspberries glowed red at the road's edge. Berries beg slow, begged pick, chew, savor flesh, and see. Berries beg the day's rose sunset. I thought about all the women who've walked here. Halfway through the week, my daughter had called. During her second ultrasound, 
she'd learned she's having a miscarriage. Her third, no DNC. She's begging nature to take care. She wanted me to drive out, but not just yet. Today, I pack and start the drive. My mind turns over how much I've loved sleeping when my body said sleep, eating when my body said eat, writing when my body said write, not asking permission to breathe. I've never had a week to myself, never. Today, I will drive across three states to reach my daughter. She'll labor for almost two days. I'll be with her, with her two sons, her husband, her labor. She'll say and keep saying, I trust you, body, to do this. I trust you, body. Wow. Thank you, Melva. Thank you so much you. for this poem. Thank you so much for this book. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today and to have this on record, to have this extra photograph about <laughs> this book. Yeah. I, I am so honored that you asked me to do this, Katerina, and I am so blessed to have known you. Um, I think I met you during uh, my first residency, which is was in 2008, I think. Um, and um, and I'm so honored. Thank you so much, Melvin. I can't wait to read what you write next. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck with everything. <laughs>